Thanks for the introduction. Privet, uh, How is everybody doing? Thank you very much for attending my talk on multiplayer games with WebXR. Today, I'm going to tell you a story. And this story is a compilation of many different experiences. Some of them include my first experience with virtual reality, the challenges that I faced, why I felt that WebVR was the right choice to make, my love story with A-Frame, and various other experiences and thoughts. This story will take you through a journey where you learn how to create various possibilities and components to create your own multiplayer WebXR game. And this story has a slight element of nostalgia because I'll be using the Pokemon universe for our demos. So let's get started. Yes, that's me, despite of the little resemblance. My name is Tanay Pant, and I currently work as an operations analyst at ResearchGate in Berlin. I'm a part of two really cool programs within Mozilla, the Tech Speakers Program and the Representatives Program. So those of you who'd like to know more about it, feel free to grab me after the talk. I promise I won't bite. I'm also an Intel software innovator in the field of IoT and have published books on Firefox OS, virtual assistance for Raspberry Pi, and web-based virtual reality. And of course, I love Pokemon, but we'll talk about that later. And that's my Twitter handle, where I'll publish the link to the GitHub repo, which contains all the demos that I'll showcase in this talk. So make sure to watch that space. So last night I was debating whether to do this or not. So we are going to learn a lot today. This is the first talk. So what do you say? Let's jazz up the energy in this room a bit. So I'm going to request you to kindly stand up on your seats. Please be here with me for a few minutes. OK, so let's do what I call the open web stretch. And it goes like this. First of all, we reach really high up there to all the open source streams. Reach high up there. Then we go down to the grassroots. We come back up and blow the winds of change. <laughs> now we reach forward, shake the money tree for fundraising. <laughs> Give it a good shake. Now we lean left to avoid the NSA. We lean right to avoid the FSB. We go all around to avoid the NSA and FSB. All right, we are done. Thank you so much. Please have your seats. So before we get started, how many of you have had any experience with virtual reality before? Developed something, played games. OK. Um, so my first experience with virtual reality was when my father one day got me this thing called Google Cardboard. And it was interesting because he simply opened an app and put his phone in the cardboard, and it worked. I particularly remember not having a very great day at that time. Probably my exams were going on. <laughs> Anyways, so I put on the Google Cardboard, and suddenly I was on a roller coaster. And I was teleported to a different place. It was spectacular, and it was love at first sight. And as time passed by, I did learn that virtual reality is not just interesting and important for gaming and entertainment, but it's also useful in very other fields. So if you are an engineering student, uh, it's very useful to be able to view your 3D models in a truly 3D space. If you're an artist or a painter, it's really interesting to be able to draw in 3D using Google Tilt Brush or A Painter. And very recently, uh, Samsung created a series of demos which was aimed at helping people with acrophobia to get rid of their fear in a safe and controlled environment. That's the fear of heights. And that resonated with me a lot because I myself have a fear of unguarded heights. And certainly, if you ask me to get rid of it by standing at the top of this building, I would be pissed off. Better have it in a safe environment. So this kind of shows us how virtual reality can be important for the betterment of mankind as well. So time passed by, and now I was in college. I had all the free time in the world, and I decided that I want to make a VR game. 
And by that time, there were quite a lot of VR devices in the market, and each one of them had a different SDK. And the size of each SDK was in gigabytes. Are you kidding me? Gigabytes? My college had a bandwidth of one gigabyte per day, and we had a set quota. And if I did manage to make an app somehow, I was doubtful that my batchmates were going to download and install apps. And these SDKs did have a steep learning curve, and you need to submit your applications to the App Store, and they act as a gatekeeper before you can finally publish and share your applications. So there were just too many points of friction, and to be honest, it was quite demotivating, especially for a freshman college student. Then one day, I heard about WebVR. So what is this? Can a browser even display graphics at a good enough rate to match performance of native apps? I was skeptical. But then it did make quite a good case. It was compelling. So first of all, it was open, because anybody can publish anything, because it's the web. Different VR scenes can be very easily connected with each other, because you have hyperlinks and you have portals in these scenes. And one could have instant VR experiences. No need to download a lot of data. You can simply send over a link to your friends through Facebook Messenger or Telegram. You click on it, as easy as that. Hmm, this indeed seemed like something that I would like to try. Moreover, I already knew JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So I was really psyched. I was going to make my first VR application, and then I learned it's not that easy. There's just too many moving components to handle. So how many of you have tried either 3JS or worked with WebGL? OK, just one person. So these are two very crucial components of making a WebVR application. And if you have used those, you would probably agree that they have a steep learning curve themselves. You need to install VR effects, you need to preload assets, initialize the screen, set up lighting, camera, take care of the responsiveness, canvas. Ugh. I did not want to go through all this trouble just to create a small prototype. And that's a lot of boilerplate code. And all this code would need updating with the new version of the libraries. And if you haven't dealt with this before, how likely would you be to create a Hello World app? That was my, exactly my thoughts. And at this point, I'm really, really close to abandoning my dream of creating a VR application. So my exams got started in the university, and sometime after a month, I came through this thing on Twitter called A-Frame. Apparently, Mozilla had started a new team called MosVR, which was developing this framework. I thought, OK, let's give this one last shot. So A-Frame is a declarative framework for building virtual reality experiences on the web. Fair enough. I started to go through the documentation and the examples, and I must admit, I was quite impressed. It was designed in such a way that it made it really easy for developers to work with no graphics knowledge, and it made prototyping and experimenting with WebXR much, much faster. So it was the perfect vehicle to kick off the WebVR ecosystem. So this is a Hello World program written using A-Frame. As you can see, it's just HTML. One line of HTML script tag includes all the a includes the A-frame minified library, no build steps required, no installs, and one line of HTML, a scene handles components like canvas, camera, renderer, lights, controls, web via polyfill, VR effect. And for further development, we put our stuff inside a scene. So let's take, quickly take a look at what we have here. So we are using some primitive object types, like box, cylinder, sphere, and pane. So this is kind of what it gives us. You can use a lot of attributes depending on the kind of object it is. So you have position, rotation, with, and you put in the x, y, z axis to kind of align them with the scene. So a frame is an entity component framework. Have anybody of you used Unity, Unity 3D? OK, quite some people. So entity component system is very popular in game development and is used by softwares like Unity. And all the objects in the scene are entities that are inherently empty objects. You plug in components to attach behavior, appearance, or functionality to these objects. 
Hence, the entity component framework provides an easy way to build up different kinds of objects. So these are some of the components that ship with A-Frame. By the way, if you're worried about having to create something like Eiffel Tower with just boxes and cylinders, you can put your mind to ease because uh, A-Frame provides us with different components like object model and collada model with which you can import 3D models that you have created in uh, third-party software like Blender and import them in the screen. They can be in a .da format, .obj format. And since A-Frame is fully extensible at its core, the community has filled the ecosystem with tons of components. And these components can do whatever they want. They have superpowers. And basically, they just have access to 3JS and the web APIs. And the component ecosystem is the lifeblood of A-Frame. You can simply drop these components as script tags and use them straight from HTML. So this is an example of advanced developers empowering other developers and working on collecting these components. So these components are collected and are made available in the A-Frame registry. It's like a store of components that the A registry team makes sure works well. And people can browse and search for components or install them using Node Package Manager. OK, enough talk. Uh, I would request all of you to kindly close your eyes for five seconds and think of your first experience with Pokemon. Uh, it could be when you were a kid, you used to watch Pokemon, or you watched Pokemon with your kids, or if you are like me, you probably got hit by a door while playing. Pokemon Go. So let's take a look at what we have here. My friends in the back row, is it visible? Perfect. So we have an HTML document. And first of all, we have included the script tag. So this contains the minified, uh, includes the minified version of the library. Then we start the body, and in the A scene, I have added a component called fog here. Basically, what it does is it obscures all the objects in fog, which are at a certain distance from the camera. So it gives you an appearance of like there's a horizon on the scene. And you can have different options on what kind of fog do you want and the color of it. And then I have used something called the asset management system of A-Frame. Basically, what it does is it preloads the assets and make performance better when you are loading your web VR scenes. And then I've started to call all the different uh, Pokemon models that I found on the internet and included their .dae file. And I also included some images which I'm using as textures in my scene. And then I've started to place these different, uh, different models all around the scene. So for example, here, I have put a model of a Pokemon ball. I have scaled it to a bigger size because whenever you are getting different models from the web, chances are they're not going to be fit for your exact scene. You'll either have to scale them down or scale them up. And then I've added the animation component to it so that it rotates about its central axis 360 degrees. And then I have placed the different uh, static models all around the scene, arranged them in a nice row, and included different box. So I have stretched them and put a uh, texture on them so that it has the appearance of a wall. And similarly, in the end, I added a plane which is basically where all the objects stand, added a grass texture to it, and then I added a sky with a light blue texture. So let's take a look at what that gets us. So everything works as expected. So we have the four different boxes with the texture of wall on them. We have the ground with texture of grass, and we have the different objects placed around the scene. So if you are using this on a mobile, you can look around by taking your mobile and changing your field of view. And you can point at places if you want to move through. If you are on a laptop, you can basically use your cursor to look around. And you can use the WASD keypad to walk on the scene. 
And if you take a look down there on the bottom right, you will see a goggle sign. So when you open this on a compatible mobile browser, what it will do is it will, you click on it and it basically splits your field of vision into two so that you can place your mobile into a headset or uh, some other low-end devices like Google Cardboard. All right, so this is a basic web VR scene. And if you remember, there were some weird things in the code. For example, if you see this position, it's minus 13 point. God, that's huge. So of course, this is something which is you have to experiment a lot, like, OK, does 111 access work for me? So that is not very good for prototyping. So to kind of help the developers working on these scenes and to kind of give it a more of a Unity flavor, A-Frame introduced something called A-Inspector. So whenever you are on a A-Frame scene, you press Control, Option, and I, and that invokes the A-Frame Inspector. So if you take a look at this inspector, on the left-hand side of the screen, you have different options like adding new cameras, and has, it has all the different entities that have used in the scene listed. So I can do a couple of things from here. For example, let's select this Pokeball. So once I open it, it gives me all the information about it, like the position, rotation, scale data, if it's actually visible and where my Colada model is loading from. It gives the path as well. And you can take, you can move it in different ways, just like you do in different 3D softwares. You can rotate it, and basically all the changes that you make, you are able to download them in the form of a new HTML file, so that way all the say, uh, changes are saved. And you can also add elements and different entities straight from the inspector. And you can then download the different uh, HTML file, the HTML file with the changes later on. So for example, if I load a different path, it gives me Pikachu. So all the changes can be made directly from A-Frame Inspector. So this really helps in prototyping quicker. Uh, just a quick question. We can see two Pikachus here. Why is this one bigger? Yeah, scale. Perfect. All right. So since A-Frame is based on HTML, it is compatible with all the existing libraries and frameworks. You can hook it up with React, Angular, uh, D3JS, different Firebase libraries. So playing in a virtual world is fun, but it's not that fun without friends. Human beings are social animals, so they need social element to be able to have much more engagement in games. So here's a demo which shows A-Frame using a component called Networked A-Frame, which you can find from the A-Frame registry. So this is a simulation of a conference room, much like this. So what I did was I opened up two sessions, one with my mobile and one which I recorded using my laptop. So one in my mobile, if I tap on the screen, it gives me feedback by waving at me. And if I turn my mobile down, it looks down. And if I turn it up, it looks up. And of course, tapping on the screen gives me feedback by waving at me. So what it does is basically it takes the position and the rotation data from mobile to be able to sync in all these actions through various uh, devices or sessions. And this component also has adapters for WebSockets, DeepStream Hub, and other real-time databases. <clears throat> so I was quite happy having made that application. I had a working VR application, and it had Pokemons in it. But then I thought to take a step back and think about the term virtual reality. So we are trying to simulate something in a way that it looks as real as possible. OK, we can probably use much more high quality photorealistic models, and they probably look almost real. So, but when I was thinking about this, I came across something called Pokemon Go. How many of you have played it, heard of it? OK, not a lot of people. So it's basically an AR application. You have your phone. There are different Pokemons which are tied to specific locations. And you kind of uh, take your phone, you have a look at your surroundings. And what happens is basically 
you see these 3D models in a real, real world. All right, it basically took the real world and then added a new layer of information on top of it. So AR, huh? Seems like the real deal. So I did some more research and came across this thing called ARGS. Adding a layer of information to the real world somehow made things seem even better. So ARGS had seamless integration with A-Frame. So this is how it works. ARGS comes with a couple of preset markers which look like this, basically square boxes with thick borders. Hero is one of them. And when you use a camera, it recognizes this marker and displays the object you want to display. So I created my own ARGS application uh, with A-Frame, and this is what it got me. I seem to have lost my cursor. There it is. So here I have included the minified version of the A-Frame library and the A-Frame ARGS, and then similar asset loading with the A asset management system. And then I have added the preset of Hero, and inside it, I have added four Pokemon models and a Pokeball which rotates about its axis. So let's take a look at what that gives us. Right, so it asks me to access my camera. And yes, there I am. So I place this Hero marker, and it basically shows the elements I wanted it to display on this when it recognizes this marker. So we have the rotating Pokeball, and we have four different Pokemons here, all around it. I was thinking of this game like Pokemon Go, which I wanted to make. Using just the preset markers is not that scalable or personalized. I wanted to create a game on my own, and I needed markers, personalized markers, and I needed a lot of them. The great thing is that the creator of this library has also provided us with a tool where you can upload your own image and it generates the marker file. And it generates the marker for you, which kind of looks like this, and it generates a pattern file. So if you go ahead and try some of the tutorials that are present, uh, make sure to include the latest version of the ARGS library because the custom markers do not work well with the previous versions and tutorials are still not updated for some reason. But well, this kind of suited what I wanted to do, and it made me want to create my own marker. So if you take a look here, we have the custom AR marker. So everything looks pretty much the same, but here, instead of a marker, I have used a marker camera. The preset is no longer hero, but it's a custom image this time. I have pointed it to the location of the pattern file, which was generated by that tool. And it displays a contact card when it recognizes this pattern. So let's quickly take a look at what that gives us. All right. It asks me to allow the camera. So now when I show the hero marker, it does not recognize it anymore. So now I have, huh. So when it recognizes my custom marker, it shows a contact card which basically has my name and contact information on it. So moving on. Another important aspect to think of while we are building these kind of applications is performance. And A-Frame allows you to monitor the stats of your application by adding stats attribute to the ACN tag. So it allows you to monitor different aspects like um, different metrics like frame per second, request animation frame, number of textures, programs, geometries that you have used, different load times and entities. So for WebVR API 1.0 aim at a stable 90 FPS. Before we end this presentation, I had a quick question. How many of you have used Google Tilbrush? Just one? Okay, so Google Tilbrush is basically used with softwares like HTC Vive, and what you do is you are able to paint in 3D using two controllers in a room scale experience. So this is a kind of off-topic slide that I've included here. So I've included it here to show you how powerful A-Frame is. 
and to demonstrate that uh, the most VR team constructed a 90 plus frame per second room scale tail brush experience in a few weeks with just a frame. So in a nutshell, VR is fun and a frame makes developing web VR content fun. So this concludes my talk. We discussed the various components which can be used to make multiplayer games with mixed reality, such as models in A-frame, animating them, adding multiplayer capabilities, and leveraging AR capabilities as well. You can also utilize the many libraries that A-Registry has to offer to, for example, like add physics to your scene. And this will allow you to have a game in which there are multi multiple markers hidden all over, for example, a conference venue, and when you view it with a camera, it shows you a Pokemon. You throw a Pokeball at it to catch it, and of course, the scores would be synced across several different players. So I can't wait to see what you all are going to make out of it. Spasiba. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you for your interesting presentation tonight. Uh, now the questions from the audience. Please put your questions in our cup, in our beautiful cup. Guys, please assist us. <laughs> it's a really good question, sorry. Uh, tell us about performance of WebVR. How large projects can be done without performance penalty? And what project will you never start with WebVR? So um, performance of WebVR has improved because it's basically a library built on the top of 3JS API. So it leverages WebGL. So with the availability and more support of WebVR by different browsers and things like Firefox Quantum coming out, it has certainly improved uh, the performance. And what project I'll never start with WebVR? Uh, that's an interesting one. So I would probably not pick up games which have like really serious photorealistic graphics because that will seriously heat up the processor like with these WebVR, uh, WebGL running in the background that seriously heats up, especially systems like MacBook. So I would say something which is like really requires physics, I would rather use something like Unity because A-Frame is still in a beta phase and it, it will take time to get there yet. Is it possible to recognize car registration signs for showing their specs? Uh, let me think about that for a bit. I would say yes, so really, if you need to recognize a car from, like, for example, its typical properties, like how it's shaped, what its head -like looks like, or what kind of logo it has, then it probably would require something like a recognition API, something like IBM Watson in the back end. Uh, and you can combine it with a camera for doing that. But if you want to make it much more simpler, there could be a recognition of certain markers that you have much like QR codes and it can show up all this information about the car. Do you have any production app examples of technology, WebVR or ARJS, or is it only prototyping tool for now? Uh, I do have some really interesting examples uh, which are kind of used in a museum setting and one of uh, Indian startups is using that in production. So I'm happy to meet after this and show you some demos. And, uh, or is it only a prototyping tool for now? I wouldn't say, I mean, it is kind of a tool which enables beginners to kind of prototype very quickly, and it's still gonna take some time to be really ready for a production scale. But there are some interesting demos for that which I'm happy to show you. What are the competitive advantages of A-Frame over Unity? So one thing which we have to understand is like the availability of internet and bandwidth is not really uniform all over the world. Like, of course, there's uh, countries like Singapore, uh, Denmark, which have really fast bandwidth, and you can, of course, leverage that for a different kind of market, but then you have like a lot of unexplored markets like Africa or uh, some Southeast Asian countries where the internet bandwidth is not that good. So I would say that well, that's one of the markets which uh, are really interesting for A-Frame because uh, it overcomes a lot of barriers, which typical SDKs or development or even uh, platforms provide as well. Can I use a photo as a custom marker? Yes, you can. 
um, picture of some building, for example, or some face. Yes, but there are a couple things to keep in mind. Photos should be slightly off-white, and uh, then you can use photos. For example, uh, if you have a look at the demos of ARJS and this tool specifically, a person put on the uh, logo of Python to kind of uh, create a recognizable marker. So yes, you can. In real multiplayer games, players can see each other. Does a frame support lag-free experience for multiplayer players with VR helmets? Yeah, so Mozilla recently uh, collaborated with another product which is called Hubs. So that also leverages um, these multiplayer capabilities and you can create your own social experience in that. That works pretty well, actually, yeah. What about browser support? Um, so I can show you a website on that as a source. So that lists which version of web VR API different browser supports. But just to give you a general overview, uh, Chrome supports uh, that, Firefox supports that, uh, the Samsung internet browser supports that, and also the default one that comes with Android supports that for now. Is there any AR libraries which work like AR on iPhone? Uh, so yeah, iPhone is some is a pain in the ass, for lack of a better term, when you are trying to use AR because it does not yet support uh, the camera API on some iPhone versions, and I'm not sure if they have any plans to add support for it. So there is an app called ArgonJS. So that basically is a browser which allows you to run your own web VR code on iPhone. So check that out. That's pretty interesting. And it also has some really interesting uh, machine learning projects within for recognition. Does it support 3D models like OBJ? Can you add GUI to the screen? Yeah, it supports OBJ. So there's a component called OBJ-model. So you can include o.obj o files and the associated .mtl files uh, for adding object models. Do you have a GitHub and can you share it? Which software can be used to create a .dae object? So you can use things like Maya 3D, uh, or let's talk about open source, uh, Blender for creating these 3D models. And yes, it's uh, Tane1337. I will also share the link of the GitHub repo with the organizers. Maybe they can share it in the Telegram chat or on VK. Are there any example of web games written with WebXR? Um, yeah, so. There is one created by, I think, Microsoft uh, used, I mean, kind of leveraging similar technologies, but wasn't using uh, A-Frame specifically. But it was kind of a simulation of Doom, but with really photorealistic graphics with uh, ray casting effects and different reflections and so on. So it's kind of like Doom, but with much nicer UI. And I'm pretty sure you can find uh, some of the games on aframe.io, which is the website for aframe. Did you catch them all? Unfortunately not. I am still missing a Pikachu. <laughs> what are the possible restrictions of uh, web VR? Performance-wise, I mean. So one of some annoying things that can happen to you are your browser crashes, which uh, with at least with Firefox Quantum has started to it doesn't happen that much. Uh, another thing would be like Safari doesn't have that good support uh, for different things which you'll use in situations where you are trying to leverage the AR capabilities. So that will, that's the top of my concerns, I would say. Where is it stored? You train the model and Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so when you're using that, uh, I get your question now, sorry. Uh, I was thinking about something else. So when you use that tool, when you upload your image or text that you want to use, it generates that marker with those thick borders for you. And along with it, it gives you a .paat file, .pattern file, which is kind of like bits of zeros and ones to kind of uh, for recognition. And it gives you that file when you create your own marker so you can store that in your, let's say, uh, in, a diff three, in a server or on your local system, and you can just point to that. So that and 
there was a second question, performance in different scenes. So if you took a closer look at the slide on stats, you might see there were quite some red pointers coming up. So there were issues like too many different entities on a scene if they're not loaded properly. So like that scene had a lot of heavy Pokemon models, which of course you would not want to do in a game or load it like that. So this was just for demo purposes because I wanted to show you all of them. So using the stats attribute in the A scene can really help you get rid of those loopholes and make sure the web app is performant. What with uh, bundling and deploy? So A registry, all these components that it has, uh, you can install them using uh, Node Package Manager, NPM, and basically what it does is you can use the web ecosystem, whatever you are using, whatever your favorite version, way of deploying it, you can use anything because it's web library anyways, and it's compatible with everything. Uh, personally, I prefer to, uh, while giving demos, I prefer to keep it on my system so in case there's a choppy internet, but uh, GitHub Pages, for example, is a really good way of doing that. Okay, thank you right. very much, Tanay. Thank you.